Welcome, you're watching Quest with me, Adil Sabir, from our studios here in the federal capital, Islamabad. Uh, in today's program, we'll be discussing two important uh, news items. Uh, firstly, uh, the sad passing of a very senior Kashmiri Hudiyat separatist leader, uh, Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani. He was 92 and he had uh, fought unabated for the uh, Kashmiri's struggle for uh, the right for self-determination. He was uh, 92 and he had been suffering from a prolonged illness. But however, there are reports coming from occupied Kashmir uh, that in fact his uh, burial uh, was uh, almost forced upon in the early hours of this morning. It is reported also that uh, Kashmir, occupied Kashmir, uh, is under curfew, lockdown, and all levels of communication have been severed. So we'll be talking about his legacy, what he stood for, uh, and what next for the Kashmir movement. And the second part of the programme will bring you up to speed with what's going on over in Afghanistan. Of course, uh, just days after uh, the American forces uh, had left once and for all, uh, in defeat after 20 years in Afghanistan, the Afghan Taliban are all lined up now to announce their new government. Now, will the new government be recognised by international community? And what will be next for the Afghan Taliban as it looks to stabilise a country which has been ravaged by war for the last 20 years? Now, to help us uh, discuss matters, uh, firstly, the passing of the senior Kashmiri Hurit leader, we're joined now by uh, Riyaz al -Haq. He is a think tank, the Centre for Islam and Global Affairs, uh, based uh, in uh, Turkey. Thank you uh, for joining us. Also, uh, Moyed Jafri, uh, senior journalist, he joins us from Lahore, and uh, general retired Amjad Shweb, he joins us uh, from Islamabad, and he is a defence analyst. Uh, welcome, uh, panel. Thank you for your participation. Uh, let me quickly uh, get some insight from uh, Mr. Riyaz, who joins us. Uh, there are a lot of different reports suggesting that um, the way and the manner in which uh, Mr. Gilani's body was removed and the burial took place without family members uh, and the consequential lockdown and curfew. What do you know of uh, what transpired in the early hours of this morning? Uh, well, uh, soon after the news spread last night that uh, Sayyid Ali Gilani, uh, no doubt the top resistance uh, icon of Kashmir movement uh, expired. He left for the heavenly abode. So what happened next is that uh, there was huge deployment of Indian forces, Indian police, paramilitary forces, and regular army uh, in and around his residence in Hyderpura, which is uptowns, uptown in the capital Srinagar. So besides the police announced that there will be restrictions, people will not be allowed to move towards Gilani's resistance, Gilani, you know, uh, on his call, tens of thousands of people would move, march, and raise uh, anti-India slogans or uh, take part in demonstrations. We quite vividly remember 2008 uprising, 2010 uprising, and 2016 uprising, and all these uh, momentous years in Kashmir resistance movement, Gilani had a leading role. So given this fact, what India did is that it was too late, it was 10 p.m. Kashmir time, and they uh, rushed to restrict, uh, impose restrictions to disallow people to march towards his home. Second, that they uh, imposed restrictions on internet uh, and the cellular, uh, local cellular networks, which uh, in fact are in place right now. Uh, only government run BSNL is uh, working. So uh, in the dead of night, uh, according to the will of Sayyid Ali Gilani, which he had basically uh, uh, written, uh, according to people close to him uh, some years back, that he should be buried in Martyr's graveyard in Srinagar. It is the largest cemetery uh, in Kashmir where most of, many of the uh, martyrs are buried who have laid down their lives in past several decades during this moment. So, but uh, what the family said uh, is this, that uh, police came inside the home, they resist resisted it, they did not allow us uh, to, uh, to take, uh, to hold the traditional Muslim rituals, allowing family members to attend the funeral. But what they did is they took the custody of the body of Sayyid Ali Gilani, and then just 200 or 250 meters away from his home in Hyderpura, there is a big Jamia where Sayyid Ali Gilani would often lead Friday congregational prayers or would hold demonstrations. So in the courtyard of that Jamia, 
there is a graveyard as well. So uh, Sayyid Ali Gilani was buried forcibly by the Indian authorities uh, there. Uh, the family said that none of its family members was allowed to attend the funeral mm -hmm. rites of Sayyid Ali Gilani. So that that is it. Uh, you know, reporters say that it was just the local native natives, uh, some of them, and the police. Uh, I mean, the cops who attended the funeral prayers. So this is the latest. So overall, the situation is uh, calm, but uh, severe restrictions have been imposed. Like uh, people are not. Uh, it takes hours to reach one's destination, and of course there uh, must be resentment against such uh, treatment that while in a, a person uh, that after his death, he is not allowed uh, the dignity, the honor to be buried according to his wish, according to the uh, traditional Muslim uh, uh, rituals and not allowing his family at least to uh, attend his uh, funeral. This speaks a lot. Uh, this basically reminds uh, of the times of Hassan al-Bana Shahid uh, Rahma from Egypt when he uh, was martyred and just a few of his close associates were allowed to attend his uh, funeral in the dead of night. So similar scenes, you know, those who are aware of uh, uh, his uh, Hassan al-Bana's uh, struggle, basically those scenes were revived yesterday when Sayyid Ali Gilani's body was taken into custody and then buried forcibly against his wishes or his uh, wishes of his family. Uh, the family, what family members have told the media, international media, that they were planning uh, that the burial will be held after Fajr or in the morning. So this is, uh, until now, this is the situation. This, uh, Ayani, until now, this is uh, what has transpired. What do you? Okay, well, well, we'll come back to uh, uh, Mr. Riaz uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what comes next for, for the future uh, of the movement. I just want to quickly now cross over to uh, Mr. Moyed Jafri. Uh, uh, Moyed, give us a little bit of a, a sort of like a brief understanding, perhaps, with international viewers of, of a, perhaps of the legacy uh, of uh, Mr. Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani. I mean, he was in many ways uh, viewed as a hardliner, but, um, and he did part ways with the Hurriyat back in 2020. Uh, but just generally, I mean, he was described uh, as one who had inspired three generations almost uh, of uh, the Kashmiri youth. Uh, a little, a little summarization of his legacy, perhaps. Uh, I mean, um, to start off, the legacy of uh, Sayyid Ali Gilani, uh, the fact that even after his death, he had such an influence over the Indian occupation forces and over India that they, they were frightened and afraid of the guy even after his death, that they had to put in place thousands of uh, troops uh, to stop people from going. That's the level of motivation that he had. That was the level of inspiration that uh, Ali Gilani uh, instilled in the people of Kashmir. Um, and uh, talk, talking about uh, the fact that he was a hardliner, he was seen as a hardliner because he always said that there is no point uh, negotiating with Indian authorities uh, because he did not believe in a word that they said. And we've seen now over uh, the past uh, four to five years, especially, how uh, he has been proven dead right. And uh, considering the legacy of uh, Sayyid Ali Gilani, uh, we can now see that whatever that he stood for is basically he has inspired not only the youth of Kashmir, not only those who believe in uh, Kashmir's right to self-determination and uh, the Kashmiri's right uh, to self-governance, but he's also inspired people and politicians who used to be previously in uh, New Delhi's camp, who were seen as uh, puppet uh, governors of Kashmir. Uh, we talk about uh, former Chief Minister Mahbubah Mufti. We talk about uh, Omar Abdullah, Farooq Abdullah's son. Uh, these were the people who used to take a very pro-New Delhi uh, line when it came to the future of Kashmir and the future, uh, future of the people of Kashmir. But now, after uh, what happened on uh, 5th of August 2019, and the way India usurped the rights of Kashmiri and uh, abrogated uh, the articles and uh, annexed India, uh, annexed Kashmir, uh, they too have now been forced to believe in what Ali Gilani uh, used to believe in and used to voice it out very clearly. And when uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, recently called in 
an all parties conference uh, he was rebuked if not more uh, by uh, those people who he uh, thought were in his pocket namely mahbuba mufti and umar abdullah and they were very clear and they very clearly pointed it out that they are not going to settle for anything less than freedom for the people of kashmir and uh, their right to self determinate and self govern so that is uh, uh, one might say people might say that oh he lived his life and uh, he lived till 92 years of age but he wasn't able to achieve what he set out to do i would argue that sayed ali gilani's legacy uh, has gained strength and it will be seen and it's still carrying on uh, stronger than ever and i believe that uh, what he stood for he has been able to convey that message to the right quarters where now everyone in kashmir including those in new delhi's pockets are now standing up for their freedom and their right to self determination which gilani saab uh, used to stand up for and of course uh, uh, just uh, to remind the viewers that i mean india cancelled kashmir's semi autonomous status uh, that was back in uh, 2019 and uh, there's almost been a, a relative blackout Uh, in the region ever since let me bring in uh, general amnesh uh, who's a defense analyst uh, uh general sir uh, it it was believed that uh, he was believed and i'm saying the perception was that he was a, a hard liner but why was india uh, so afraid uh, of uh, mr uh, gilani and secondly how would you describe his relationship with pakistan sulla rahman rahim sayed ali gilani i think he was uh, the only politician in kashmir who never minced his words and was very clear in his elaborations and in, in his declarations and always said that hum hai pakistani pakistan hamara hai he identified himself and his people with pakistan and i consider him a pakistani of kashmirian origin the all other politicians even they were with, with him or even if they was struggling for the right of self determination like uh, yasin malik and others they never identified themselves the way uh, sayed ali gilani used to do that and they always said that we want we 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 want to have negotiations we'll sit down across the table and then talk about it and uh, we want to have this uh, right of self determination all such thing but ali gilani i think he was right from the beginning he was very clear that this is the demand and this is for this he has been struggling all his life he was the originator of this slogan hum hai pakistani pakistan hamara hai and i think this is the main legacy that he has left behind his followers will always identify themselves with pakistan as pakistani so i think there is a there is a very deep relationship the man has left that relationship with his own followers and at the same time he he kept on pushing and kept on strengthening that relationship throughout his life uh, then at the same time i think the other aspect of his uh, declarations his speeches and his uh, statements used to be that he never had any any uh, any sympathy any love or any kind of uh, mercy for the indian rule and indian uh, subjugation which was imposed on the kashmir uh, on the kashmiri people so he would say i i heard his word saying that uh, the, the 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 indian democracy will be buried here indian democracy uh, will be will be thrown out of the window all such things where he he would criticize india in very very clear words an unbending person a person who never thought of a compromise on any terms so i think there are very few people very very few people as far as i know who are so clear in their mind about the goals and objectives that they want to achieve and they do not have that kind of uh, diplomacy or language which they try to hide their words or try to mince their words and try to convey things indirectly i think he his approach was very very direct and that is where i think the indians were scared of him because the man uh, could look into their eyes and uh, still tell them whatever he his demands were there this is uh, i mean only a very bold person can do that people all those people those political parties who were there in uh, uh, gopkar resolution they were scared of him. they never talked talked a word about uh, a word against him never tried to contact him they always stayed away from him because they had a fear and he was an unchallenged leader that is where i think everybody followed him even the parties uh, other parties who had joined 
Hurriyat Conference. They never claimed independent leadership and Ali Gilani was an unch unchallenged leader of the Kashmiri struggle. So that way I think uh, we have lost a person. They have lost a person of a, of a stature which perhaps is not available now in, in the Kashmir struggle. At the same time, you can see the scare which the Indians had, uh, the way he has been buried, and the way he was always uh, put behind the bars or sometimes even the house rest. In this age, he was uh, facing this Indian atrocity. He was uh, uh, put under house arrest there. So this was the scare. I think Indians always realized and they had known that here is a person who will never be able to compromise with India on any terms. Okay, and that's why I think they were If scared. I could just quickly uh, interject, just kind of quickly uh, uh, move on. We'll come back to you, uh, of course. I just want to quickly uh, cross over now uh, back to uh, Riyaz al-Haq, who joins us uh, from uh, Turkey. Just very briefly, of course, uh, we have seen uh, over the past uh, almost two years, uh, it's almost passed uh, since uh, the, the, the status of uh, Kashmir was stripped from uh, them. How now do you think the, the movement will continue uh, in the absence of, of, of a senior leader like this? And what are your thoughts going forward now? I mean, of course, uh, Kashmir has been off the radar internationally. Uh, Pakistan has been, of course, on a number of forums internationally, has, has been fighting the case for Kashmir's right to self-determination. Uh, what next now for the, for the Kashmiri struggle? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts and what are you hearing on the ground? Well, uh, for Kashmir observers, if we just uh, uh, shed light for past, you know, on past five years, Sayyid Ali Gilani has been the leading light, rather the leader who uh, led the movement, issuing calendars, awaring people for past, you know, several, actually for past four decades, uh, but uh, past two decades, essentially uh, after 2000, early years of 2000, uh, he has been at the forefront. But s since 2016 uprising, basically what happened, the mass anti-India uprising uh, against Indian rule in Kashmir, Indian administered Kashmir, it, uh, for Kashmir observers, and for me as a student of uh, current affairs and our region, it taught New Delhi many lessons uh, how to manage Kashmir. So since then, uh, Kashmiris have not been able to sit down, rest, and think, what next? So what happened? You just, uh, uh, I, I'm drawing your attention towards past five years, four years, since 2016. But in 2016, Kashmiris were on road since uh, July 8 until December. It was shut. Then what happens is that next, uh, uh, New Delhi launches an onslaught, all out, war on Kashmir. Uh, there are raids, Hurriyat leaders are arrested, commoners, you know, common people, whoever is associated with Hurriyat conference, yani the freedom movement, actively part taking participate, they are being arrested, they are put in jail. And then not just that, they are being moved out of Kashmir jails to Indian jails, making it costlier for their families to sustain. Uh, first is that. Second, uh, second thing is, you see, and there is a design that Sayyid Ali Gilani had already, you know, uh, was coming of age, you know, he was closing, coming closer to 90 years of his age. So what happened is that his men, his close aides, who were the Ruher of Hurriyat Conference or Tahriki Hurriyat, they were jailed, they were put behind bars. So uh, effectively, uh, you know, uh, taking away uh, the, the, the authority from around him. Mm -hmm. It was Sayyid Ali Gilani who would be uh, the face of the movement, but it were these people who would then ensure, you know, uh, reaching out to people and the cadre. So this all was effectively made useless. The systems, the infrastructure they had, the organizations they have, uh, you know, Tahri Kuryat was the, uh, is the main. He, he himself launched it in 2004 and was the major uh, constituent of all parties with a conference. Uh, so, then Gilani Saab's age was not on his side, health was not in, on his side. So with the passage of time, 2017, 18, he was under house arrest. And essentially since 2015, 
people were barred from meeting him. Common people, no one would be able to, uh, was allowed to meet him. He was under house arrest. Uh, there were two police, there are two police vents which basically had, you know, uh, uh, they were stationed just outside his main gate, main entrance of his residence. And uh, nobody was, uh, commoners were not allowed to meet him or his party men or his party cadres, they were not allowed to meet him. So this leadership, and then comes the media gag, you know, uh, that uh, I am reminded of a news story carried by one of India's newspapers in 2017 February. Uh, it was, they are quoting an Indian uh, home ministry report that if you have to control Kashmir story, you control three things, media, masjid, and madrasa. So the thing is that the dissemination of information, the dissemination of statements, the dissemination of directions which say that Gilani would uh, give to the people of Kashmir, they are being halted. They are being that there is a communication gap between Sayyidi Gilani and people. And then with the passage of time until 2019, when we reach it, when India re-annexed Kashmir, uh, he had already basically, his health had uh, deteriorated a lot. So uh, uh, even then, even though we had statements from Hurriyat, even they were not properly carried by the newspapers, or right. uh, you know, with the passage of time, now they are, they are not being carried by. So there is a challenge, of course, you know, uh, that the leadership vacuum that uh, Kashmir faces. Okay, but I'm gonna, the situation gonna have to leave. So I'm gonna have to leave it. There. I'm gonna have to leave it there with you, uh, Mr. Rial. We're running a little bit short on time. Of course, a leadership vacuum, and of course, when we have what we're seeing, the world is forgetting that on the one hand, on, on Pakistan's western borders, you've got an occupational force which is leaving. And on, the, on its eastern borders, you have an occupational force which is still uh, trampling, what is it, on the human values and civil uh, rights in occupied Kashmir. Time now for a short break, still to come on the other side, discussing the very latest from Afghanistan as the Afghan Taliban look to set up government in Kabul. That and a lot more after this break. Welcome back to The Quest. Uh, let's switch focus now, it's part of the programme. And of course, we'll uh, talk about Afghanistan. 31st of August uh, was uh, held as a, a new dawn uh, in Afghanistan as the Taliban uh, swiftly moved into power and the American forces left uh, after Joe Biden fulfilled one of his election promises by pulling all US troops, bar some 100 or 200 personnel still left over those apparently who did not leave voluntarily after the evacuation, which took place uh, in the middle of August. Now, the world community uh, sort of braces itself in many ways. Uh, of what next? Uh, the what if? What next? Uh, and of course, uh, the Taliban are now struggling uh, to convince the world community that they're not going to go back to the way they were back 20 years ago. Uh, in fact, as we speak, uh, the Afghan Taliban are in the process of formulating and putting together a, a government how that government will function, how that government will function uh, within the international community uh, remains to be seen. However, the United States, uh, of course, uh, uh, who has suffered a defeat in Afghanistan, uh, is now flip-flopping as to how it will deal with Afghanistan. Some quarters within the US are suggesting cooperation, and some are suggesting that they need to be taken uh, with a bit of salt and that nobody would really recognize the Taliban and would not believe their words. Now to help us discuss this, so we're joined by James Dorsey, who's a senior fellow at the um, Institute over in Singapore. And of course we have General uh, Amish Web with us and uh, Moya Jafri joining us from Lahore as well. Let me start off with uh, uh, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, uh, a lot of flip-flopping going on in the international media about uh, what the Americans uh, believe to be uh, happening next. And at the same time, uh, they also understand that to some degree they will need uh, the Afghan Taliban to some degree or close cooperation with Afghan Taliban to some degree if they are to defeat ISIS-K in Afghanistan. How do you see uh, the next uh, couple of weeks panning out uh, given what has happened in such a quick space of time? Uh, this, there still is this, uh, this, uh, this trust deficit I believe uh, between the Americans and the Taliban but of recently we heard that of course that there was cooperation uh, as the last flights were leaving the evacuation process was facilitated uh, by the Taliban your take on it uh, James 
think we've had a trust deficit for 25 years. Uh, so why would there not be a trust deficit today? Uh, the fact that you had a degree of cooperation simply because the, the uh, um, Taliban wanted the United States out and the United States wanted to get out, um, I'm not sure one should read too much into that. What I do think is true is that the Taliban are trying to put their best foot forward, uh, whether, they're gonna, whether that is sincere, whether they're going to succeed in that or not, only time will tell. Uh, the other issue is that one can ask, I mean, one's got to ask oneself, uh, the Islamic State in Khorasan, who's, who, to whom do they pose the greatest threat? I don't know that they pose the greatest threat to the United States today. I think they pose the greatest threat in principle to the Taliban and to uh, Afghanistan's neighborhood. So I'm not sure. I think that the United States has obviously an interest in ensuring that the Taliban do not allow Pakistan to be used as a uh, launching pad for attacks beyond Afghanistan borders. Frankly, so do Afghanistan's neighbors, including China and Russia. But James, is it a question uh, for the Americans that you know, it's choose your poison, really, in many ways, isn't it? I mean, you've got Al Qaeda, which they say they've dismantled. Al Qaeda, it seems, uh, were perhaps uh, on the same page as ISIS when it came to uh, U.S. occupation and, and the U.S. in general, uh, per se. So, I mean, how do you uh, read this kind of like strange troika which is developing or has developed or still exists within Afghanistan? And, and, and surely the Americans uh, will be keeping one close eye on that, regardless of whether or not they're in Afghanistan anymore or not. Keep a close eye on it, and they should keep a close eye on it. Uh, it would be uh, uh, it would be you know dismissive if they didn't. Having said that, I think also look, there are a lot of bad guys, but uh, there's a danger in throwing all the bad guys into one label. They, these are bad guys, and that's it. Fact of the matter is, there are deep differences between various of these militant groups. Uh, Al Qaeda, uh, the Islamic State strategy may very well still be attacks, if they could, in the West, which they have not been able to do since 2017. Not because they didn't want to, but because Western counterterrorism has improved significantly. But uh, there is a serious question to be raised whether Al Qaeda is interested in the, those attacks today. They've chosen much more to be a local actor and to, uh, uh, to, to earn their spores on governance issues, on advising other uh, militant groups, rather than going out and trying to do something in Washington, Paris, or London, or wherever. So, with other words, that doesn't necessarily make Al Qaeda any better. Uh, than, uh, than the Islamic State, but the threat it poses is a different one. Right, uh, talking about recognition now, I mean, of course, uh, with a newly, when, when, when the newly announced government uh, takes form and shape, uh, General Amjad, of course, recognition for the Taliban is critical in the international community. Uh, we've heard from various different quarters of, of how the abandonment back uh, in the last, uh, uh, in the last, Episodes that we saw uh, in the Afghan war against the Russians, where there was uh, a lot of call for not being left uh, abandoned, left abandoned, left abandoned. And now uh, it seems history might repeat itself. But there are strong calls that economically Afghanistan possibly uh, would be soon to default, if not helped. How important is it for the international community, uh, General Shib, to reach out to the Afghan Taliban and to actually provide them with all of the uh, perhaps assistance they can in order for them to stand on their own two feet right now at this very moment in time? See, this country has been through a long period of instability and also civil war and then the war imposed by United States and its allies. The country is devastated. It doesn't have its economy if uh, Really, they want to earn something, then they will have to uh, grow poppy and then start marketing narcotics here and there, which perhaps will be a threat to the uh, entire world. 
their own economy is just not there. They don't have any kind of income, and uh, very little they can earn from the export of fruits, etc. There are some some uh, items that they grow there. So that way, I think it is in the interest of the international community to reach out, firstly, to avoid a humanitarian uh, crisis there, because uh, there is a shortage of food, there is a shortage of uh, uh, medicines. Then at the same time, if a civil structure is to function, then you have to uh, give monthly, monthly salaries to the government servants, etc., and the government doesn't have that money with them. And if the international community, they do not reach out, they ignore them, then I think not only the crisis uh, will aggravate, but at the same time, the, the people may not be tempted to again grow poppy and start marketing. Taliban otherwise are not inclined towards uh, this poppy growing and they, they, they are very strict on it. They will not allow. But then how, how will they cope up with the uh, growing economic uh, calamity? So naturally, they, they, these people, whether they are uh, uh, they willingly they do it or not, but they will perhaps will have to do something to earn and ultimately uh, to, to start doing, doing something about their country. So that's why I think it is very important. Then second, I think the, the objection which the international community has been raising was that the conduct which they saw during 96 uh, to 2001 was <coughs> barbaric and at the same time was uncivilized. Uh, perhaps the human rights were violated at the same time the women were suffering, they were not given their rights. But now I think it is a different story. Right from the day they entered into an agreement with the Americans, they have been behaving in a very, very civilized manner. They have been sticking to everything that they had promised, even in the case of the agreement or otherwise whatever they had declared themselves. So that way, I think, and I think in many ways, their humanitarian approach is much better than even uh, if we compare that with the civilized world. The cross-the-board uh, forgiveness and cross-the-board uh, um, ignoring everything, all, all sorts of enmities, etc. They, they have been telling people, look, uh, just let's bury the past. And they have really buried the past, and they are negotiating with everyone. So from that point of view, I think we must have confidence in them and also encourage them to keep on following a civilized path where they, should, where they can become a vibrant member of the civilized international community. But we have to remain in touch. We have to keep on... Uh, Keep, keep on impressing upon them that this is very important for them if they really want to be part of the international community. So that way, I think it will be very important to reach out to them, help them out financially, remain in contact with them, cooperate with them in various areas, particularly the terrorism, uh, so that they, they, they do not start accommodating terrorists in their own territory. And for that, they will have to have their complete threat on every inch of their land. Absolutely. So we have to support them in a way that they start exercising their risk all over the country and uh, there, there's not a, um, even the smallest space which is, uh, where the terrorists are allowed to grow or try terrorists are allowed to uh, keep on uh, working clandestinely. Absolutely. So I, mean, it's just a... I think it's the international community which has to take them with open arms and uh, with that I think we'll be able to bring them to the mainstream of the civilized nations and talking of open arms, not just talking about financial aid of course we're talking about this mass migration we're going to be talking about that we're hearing about of it with countries closing their borders for obvious reasons uh, we expect perhaps i mean the, the iran border i mean it's 600 kilometers plus and it's a it's a deserty region uh, people obviously looking for ways to get to perhaps turkey and, and, and europe I, bring, I want to just bring in the Moyed Jafri, I mean, this human uh, migration that we are all expecting in Pakistan, I'm talking about Pakistan in particular, the refugees, uh, I suppose all depends on whether or not the Afghan Taliban actually allow them to leave the country uh, in many ways. But this is what the UNHCR has been saying, that this is a crisis ready to happen unless international community and other countries, particularly Europe, Germany, France, others who have opened up their, uh, their, their, uh, uh, their arms and doors, uh, for people in the past, particularly post-Syrian war, that this must happen again because Pakistan simply cannot cope with the influx and we've already housed three million. Uh, how much more can we take? So your take on how the international community should uh, play its part in accommodating those who want to leave Afghanistan? 
Uh, you're, very, you're very rightly pointed out that uh, the amount and the numbers uh, when it comes to mass migration and uh, refugee outflux uh, will basically depend on how the Taliban uh, based, uh, come across as governors over the past, over the next, say, couple of months or more than that. Uh, because uh, there was uh, our correspondent uh, in uh, Kabul, when we talked to her and we talked to a couple of other analysts regarding this uh, mass migration that was triggered at the Kabul airport, uh, there were reports, and uh, she talked to a lot of people, majority of whom were basically migrating for economic reasons because they were sick and tired of uh, the situation they've been facing uh, in, in Afghanistan, which had uh, apparently nothing for them. And because everybody at the airport, everybody in Kabul thought that they were going to land in Washington, none of them knew that some of them were going to Uganda, for that matter. Uh, so that migration was mostly uh, uh, triggered uh, for, uh, for greener pastures and better economic conditions. Uh, like you rightly pointed out, a similar situation can happen uh, if the Taliban. Now, the second, uh, the, the second uh, side to this is basically human rights and the way uh, the people are governed uh, and uh, the element of fear uh, of uh, the Taliban based on uh, the situation that was in the past. But once again, we need to be very, very uh, uh, fair to the Taliban, not that uh, we're taking their sides, but... Uh, the world community right now, it's like walking on eggshells for the Taliban. Uh, like one wrong move and you're back to square one. Uh, I, I think the world community will be a little, uh, need to be a little more uh, realistic in its approach when it comes to the litmus test uh, regarding governance. Because if, if we talk about one single instance of somebody, one uh, particular uh, member or one particular uh, Taliban uh, uh, caning somebody somewhere, that, that, that happens uh, anywhere uh, in the United States that can happen. That happens in India all the time. We've seen videos coming out. Uh, we don't label them as a terrorist state, do we? Uh, so basically, uh, the world will need to be a little bit more fair towards the Taliban regarding that. But if that situation does arise, uh, then obviously there will be mass migration. Pakistan, uh, and you, like you said, uh, uh, countries have sealed off their borders. Uh, today, Pakistan's uh, interior minister, Sheikh Rashid, also said that Pakistan might consider uh, closing certain border, opening, over border openings with uh, Afghanistan. It's basically because of uh, a lot of unknown factors. We wouldn't know. Uh, there's no way to figure out who is coming into your country from Afghanistan. It could be people who are scared, who are looking for a better life, who basically want security and safety. Or it could be others who have been waiting there, like we talked about uh, earlier, uh, who are just looking to disrupt and destabilize your country and are working for some other elements. So it's, it's, it's a complicated situation, and it doesn't really have a clear uh, uh, binary answer of yes or no. So uh, I believe it, 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 the onus, once again, uh, fairly or unfairly, falls on the Taliban and how they're able to convince the people to stay. But if, uh, if they do not uh, stay good to their word that they're giving the international community, uh, I, I believe that there could be problems, and we, we could see massive refu uh, refugee influx into bordering countries, especially Pakistan, or other countries that these people see as uh, more friendly and better to uh, pursue their lives in the future. So we're probably going to have to wrap up the program uh, for now. Uh, and of course, uh, over the next couple of days, it's very important to uh, keep a very cl close eye on, uh, in fact, what dispensation the Afghan Taliban uh, decide to put at the Home of Affairs in Kabul and how that dispensation interacts with the world community. I think it's important for the world community also to recognize that the the abandonment we saw of yesteryear uh, cannot repeat itself, history cannot repeat itself, and this uh, war-ravaged country deserves better. As one of the analysts was saying, it's not because they fear the Taliban necessarily that people want to move. It may just well be that they want better economic status for themselves and for their family and for their loved ones, and I think uh, that is a, a right that they deserve. Uh, that's all for now. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow. For now, goodbye.